No, no. Uh, well, we'll see. We, they might be not quite that. Good morning, everyone, on this uh, better day than yesterday. Um, this is a joint committee between the Committees of Public Safety, Missile Services and Properties Committee, Development Planning and Sustainability Committee. I want to thank uh, Chair Kevin Bishop of Municipal Services and Councilman Harrison of um, Development Planning and Sustainability for being here at the table with us. They chair two very important committees of City Council. Um, I want to thank again members of the administration here. This is a very important issue we have before us. So at this time, Madam Clerk, do we have a quorum? Yes. Would you care to call the roll? Present. Santana. Present. Slide. Present. Spencer. Present. Star. Here. Mr. Chairman. Of the committees in question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Clerk. Uh, before I um, call upon um, and we get into ordinance number 54-2023, uh, I would like to ask the chief uh, for an update on the officer who was wounded yesterday. Chief? To chair the council members, as you're all aware, one of our officers was uh, shot twice last night, once in the left forearm and once in the right thigh. Uh, he's doing well. Um, I'm happy to say uh, I think God was watching over him. There's no question, I don't think. I know God was watching over him. Um, when I talked to him yesterday, he was up. I was uh, telling uh, Councilman Casey uh, I, was, I was happy to walk into the room and see him sitting up uh, laughing big smile on his face and so forth. I thought maybe it was a paid medication, but it was good to see that because last year we had a different circumstances. Uh, so I was happy to see that he's doing well. Talked to his wife, talked to his mother, and he's doing well. Also, additionally, there were two other officers who were responding to assist him. They were involved in a pretty serious accident uh, at uh, East 30th and Carnegie. I talked to them both at the hospital. They also were at Metro, and they both are doing well. So all, all things considering, the officers are all doing well. Do we have any indication as it pertains to the suspects? Um, to the chair, to the council members, at this particular time, no. We have uh, relatively good pictures of the at least two of the uh, uh, four suspects uh, in, the, in the stolen vehicle, the stolen Kia, that the uh, officers approached, and uh, the officers uh, received fire from at least one of the subjects uh, with a pretty heavy-duty weapon, um, according to the officer that I talked to. Um, he said that the young man that shot at him uh, had a, a pistol, but he had a drum magazine, and that means it, it probably has a capacity of probably about 50 rounds. So um, we're very fortunate. It wasn't, uh, uh, we're, we're talking about something different today. Okay. But as it stands right now, we have pictures out, uh, not very clear of their faces, but we do have pictures of uh, at least two of the individuals involved in this. Okay. But this was a result of another stolen car. 
to the chair, to the council members, is correct. Uh, both the officers, uh, both the detectives uh, were involved uh, in a, uh, what we call a Kia Hyundai uh, um, stolen car detail. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, they went to the area of East um, 22nd and Cedar when they observed what they be to believed to be a stolen Kia. They approached the car, the individuals jumped out, and yes, it was indeed a stolen uh, Kia as well. I can tell you right now um, to my colleagues, we have the our attorneys looking at this um, <clears throat> the Kia um, Hyundai issue, but the bigger issue is the fact that on TikTok, they have it posted on their social media where you can steal the car, the, both vehicles in less than a minute. Mm. And it's like they're promoting auto theft. So we have our attorneys looking at what action that th this municipality can take against TikTok. So we're going to hear very shortly from our attorneys, and I'm, I'm just alerting the administration as well. There has to, there, these companies have to be held accountable, and, and the social media is promoting auto theft in our country, and um, it's absolutely ridiculous at this point. So, but anyway, the other thing I need to say, on behalf of City Council, I want to express our deepest sympathy to Director Kerry Howard on the loss of his father. And, um, you know, we can be at this table, we can argue, we can be on different, um, we can take different votes and we can be in different positions. But at the end of the day, we are all one family here at City Hall. So I, I needed to express that on behalf of all members of City Council, our condolences to him and members of his family. At this time, again, I want to thank uh, the chairman, Councilman Bishop, Councilman Harrison from the two other committees that have joined us in this joint hearing. Uh, this is a big decision on behalf of City Council. Um, I was going through some historic records. The last time um, we made a decision on a police headquarters was in the 70s, early 70s, and then prior to that was around 1924, I believe. So we're talking about approximately every 50 years we've made a real difficult um, decision and a long-lasting decision on our police headquarters. So the decisions we make now within this council, um, I will tell you my brothers and sisters, my colleagues here, that whatever decision we make here today, this will have a long-lasting impact for approximately 50 years on the division of police on the city of Cleveland. So at this time, ordinance number 54-20, 23, by council members House, Bishop, Plensick, Harrison, and Griffin by departmental request an emergency ordinance authorizing the directors of capital projects, public safety, and or public works to enter into a development and or purchase agreement with turn development, turn DEV, or its designate for the development and sale of real property and buildings located at 2530-2570 Superior Avenue as a new police headquarters, authorizing the commissioner purchases and supplies to acquire the property, authorizing other agreements to implement, authorizing the purchase of materials, equipment, services, and supplies to equip the new facility for the moving services, authorizing consulting contracts, and authorizing the directors to apply for and accept grants or grants except gifts or grants for various public or private entities to implement this ordinance. First time reading was in January 9th, 2023. It was referred to the various departments and divisions. It was approved by the Mayor's Office of Capital Projects. It was approved uh, by the uh, Director, uh, looks like the Director of Public Safety, because that's kind of blurred on this piece, and approved by Director of Public Works on 1-12-23. So at this time, I'm going to call upon whoever from the administration. I would ask Director DeRosa if you would identify, again, officially yourself, and then who is at the table for the viewing public. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thanks for having us here today. Um, before I um, introduce everyone here today, um, our suggestion would be to go through the, the PowerPoint presentation okay. next and then to review the questions that we received yesterday from um, City Council's office. Um, we received 19 questions yesterday from uh, City Council staff yeah. that we could go through. Um, yeah. And if that sounds like a good way that, to that's, proceed. I'm fine with that, but you want to introduce okay. people at the table. Yes, yeah, so um, my name is uh, Jamie DeRosa. I'm the director of Capital Projects. Um, to my left. 
Chief Wayne Drummond, Division of Police. And to my right. Carter Edmond, uh, Manager of Architecture and Site Development. Suzanne DeGenero, I'm the Commissioner of Real Estate. Just hit the, yeah, pull the mic up to your uh, close. John Penny, Managing Partner of Turndove. Okay, thank you. Okay, Director, the floor is yours. Thank you, and... Um, oh, wait a minute, unless the uh, chairs of the other committees have any questions before... Okay, thank you. Could the gentleman at the end is uh, John Payne, Managing Partner Penny. for who? Penny. John Penny. Penny. Managing Partner for who? For... Turndev. Who? Turn Turndev. That's the developer that's listed in the ordinance. Okay. Okay, thank yep. you. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So um, Carter Ebden is going to go through the PowerPoint presentation um, with us. This is the same PowerPoint presentation we went through before, um, and we'll give a little bit more details as we go through it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, as mentioned, this is the same PowerPoint we went through uh, with uh, the previous committee. Um, we wanted to show, make sure we were showing the same thing, although there is some updated information which we'll get into as we get into, uh, later into the discussion. Um, so the outline for this PowerPoint, a uh, little bit of project history, then uh, we'll get into the uh, summary of the RFP process and the proposals we received, uh, looking specifically at the proposal from the aircraft building, the, uh, which was the um, successful proposer, uh, comparison of that proposal and the, uh, the outlook for that versus uh, other options that were considered and uh, previous options, and then uh, talk a little bit about the deal structure. Okay, before we proceed, can everybody see the screen? We pulled down that sh shade that was causing a blur. Can everybody see the screens? Okay, thank you. Um, the Opportunity Corridor uh, project that was, uh, was under design for, for some time prior to this, uh, that site was announced in 2019. Uh, some site improvements uh, were conducted there and some lot consolidation, which we can get into. Um, there was a ceremonial groundbreaking held in uh, December of 2021, um, and there were bonds issued for that. We can get into more detail of the bonds that have been issued, uh, how those have been allocated, what we have remaining, what's been spent, and, and so forth. Uh, so we can get into as much detail as you like on that. Um, as uh, we started working, as we started to take over that uh, project last year and we got into the program of the facility, what was being built, the cost, the timeline, um, we realized that the uh, rising budget costs were exceeding what was anticipated and exceeding what had been allocated for the police headquarters. And also that the, what was programmed for the Opportunity Corridor site was not the entire uh, police headquarters program, that there were other program elements that would need to find another home, and that cost uh, was also not uh, accounted for within the Opportunity Corridor budget. Um, it also necessitated that those additional program elements would be located elsewhere, which meant that operationally, the police headquarters would be split into different locations, which uh, was problematic. Um, also, the delivery timeline, looking at 2026 or so uh, for uh, opening and moving into that facility. And at, at that point, the timeline for the rest of the facilities, the rest of the program that was not at the OC was unknown, uh, was not really acceptable. Uh, we started to receive some unsolicited proposals from other property owners. Uh, and we started looking at those and looking at trying to value engineer the design that we had in hand. Um, and we were starting to get, for, we were starting to get a couple of proposals. And also we were starting to get different levels of information from different proposers. And we said, okay, we really need to give anybody that you know, wants to propose on this a chance to propose, and we want to make sure we're getting apples to apples information, and then compare what we're getting in proposals to what we already have in hand. So we issued a request for proposals in October of 2023. Um, I have a copy of that RFP, so if you want to get into any questions about the, the criteria there, but essentially the goals were deliver the first class facility to meet all of CDP's operational needs in one location, to reduce costs, to get back to that budget, and use the funds, city's funds responsibly, and uh, expedite the, the, the uh, schedule to get CDP into a permanent home ASAP. And uh, as you mentioned, Mr. Chair, a 50-year decision. We actually hope this is longer than 50 years, uh, but uh, you know, to get into that permanent, uh, permanent location. Um, 
We received six responses to the RFP. Um, some were more complete than others. Uh, they were ranked by a team of evaluators that included myself, uh, the Commissioner of Real Estate, representatives from CDP, uh, and a, a couple others. I don't have the, all the names at my fingertips. but uh, So an interdisciplinary team evaluated the, um, uh, the proposals based on criteria that were laid out in the RFP. Um, here are the uh, costs that were submitted. Uh, some didn't have complete uh, cost information, but um, this this is the uh, the relative values of those, as, as much as we could determine from the um, submittals that were received. Uh, just briefly, could you tell us where those locations are at? Yes, of course. Um, so the Artcraft Turndev, the one that we're discussing yes. today, is on Superior Avenue, uh, right at the inner belt. Um, I'm, you're probably all familiar with that uh, seven-story, uh, 250,000 square foot building. Yes. Um, the Brandywine East 55th was on a currently vacant site on uh, North uh, East 55th Street. Um, Cresco Tyler Village, that's uh, the um, elevator comp former elevator complex uh, on um, Superior. Um, 1801 Superior, that's the former Plain Dealer building. Um, 2001 Payne, that's the, uh, the facility that we own, that's, that's Public Safety Central. Uh, the KRA Bluffs was actually proposing two locations. It was, it was a little unclear from the proposal. Just, just a moment, yeah. you're, you're, that's the old uh, third district? Yes. 2001, okay. Yes. okay, keep going. Yep. Uh, mm -hmm. KRA Bluffs, uh, the proposal is a little unclear if they were proposing both or one or the other of two possible locations, one being um, just by the, the stadium here at the, the lot, the, the parking lot there, and the other uh, on um, north, of, uh, north of Lakeside around uh, East 18th. Okay. Um, the Opportunity Corridor and uh, the Opportunity Corridor 2001 Payne split, these two are not proposals that we received, but these were the designs that we had been working on. And what we wanted to do was essentially put those in the same mix as if they were proposals and evaluate them all on the same criteria, score them all together. Um, so the opportunity corridor was the design we've been looking at, and we had also been looking at if we could put like half of the program in Public Safety Central, the old third district, how that might help us. As you can see, there was some savings over the opportunity corridor, but it was still a pretty big lift. Okay. And it would still be in two locations. Okay. Uh, point, uh, yes, yes, Mr. Jones. Mr. Chairman, you're talking about the last two bullet points, the Opportunity Corridor and the Payne Avenue, and you have figures that you have figures that are there, 161 million, mm -hmm. and then 143.5, and you know, of course, 0.6 at the the top one. Were, were that was that separate with having everything that you wanted to have? Um, at, at either or site location, this would be that total inclusive cost? Yeah, so both of those numbers were cost estimates that we did with our uh, consultants. Um, and the Opportunity Corridor, the 161 million, that represents um, everything that would be built at the Opportunity Corridor and some cost assumptions for everything that would have to go somewhere else. Though that somewhere else wasn't identified, but we had a, had a good idea of what type of construction, how much, so we could you know, at least estimate what it would cost. Okay. Now, depending on where it goes, that might vary. But so that 161 million is for everything for the police headquarters, as much as possible at the Opportunity Corridor and the other things somewhere else. The 2001 Payne split, we essentially reduced the Opportunity Corridor design from a planned 180,000 square feet to 100,000 square feet. And that 80,000 square feet plus about 10,000 square feet of other stuff would then go at Public Safety Central, 2001 Payne. The idea being that renovating that on a square foot cost would be less than building a new, uh, new building. So that's, that's where that savings comes in. So in that scenario, everything that the police headquarters needs would be either at the Opportunity Corridor or at 2001 Payne. So even with this 161.6, you still would not have been able to put everything on the site location of Opportunity Corridor. Correct. Okay. Even if you increased that cost, it still wouldn't fit. It, it just wouldn't fit. The, I mean, you know, you can always make something okay. fit by going taller and having a parking garage, and you know, there's there's ways to make things fit, but. Okay. You know that okay. that would also add to the cost. We we understand that. The only thing I will say to, to members of the committee, when the opportunity corridor site was picked, we were told that everything was going to go there in that building. 
and now we're hearing something completely different, which does not make me happy at the time the presentation that was made to city council, because what's our position has always been, whether it's good news or bad news or different news, as long as it's the straight news at the table, and now to hear that that site after that amount of money was not going to accommodate the division of police is not very, not very pleasant to hear at this point. So we're going to go on. Thank you. Proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so the selected site, uh, based on the proposals received and the evaluation against the existing design, uh, is the Artcraft Building. You can uh, kind of see that yellow star off to the right on uh, Superior Avenue at the Inner Belt. Uh, zoomed in a little bit. Uh, you can see there's the um, on-ramp to the inner belt, just to the east of the building. The building itself, as I mentioned, is about 250,000 square feet. And then uh, just to the south of that, there are the various parking lots which are being consolidated into a single parcel where the um, parking garage and uh, a few other items will be. Uh, this is the existing building as it looks now. Um, I've spent time in this building, I've, I've looked at it, the structural engineers have looked at it, there's been, uh, we've gotten a lot of due diligence reports, building envelope condition, structural condition. Um, I can tell you this is a very sound, very stoutly built building. Um, there, it does need work, it needs facade restoration and we're uh, looking at exactly what that scope would be. Um, it needs a new windows and you know an entire new interior, um, but the, it's uh, as they as they say on the home improvement programs, it's got really good bones. Um, so the um, this this building, is, uh, speaking as an architect, this building I feel does have a lot of architectural character. It's not a landmark. It's not a landmark district, but we do want to be respectful of the character of the building. Um, so the restoration will be done in that uh, in that mindset. Uh, the new windows, for example, will have a visual profile that will look similar to the historic windows, but they will, be, they will perform like modern windows, so there will be high-performing systems there. Uh, and we are looking at um, you know, high-performing systems throughout. I'm going to show you some renderings. These are from the proposal. So these renderings were done by the proposer <coughs> before really starting to engage with us. So it's all quite preliminary. Um, but it's useful at least to get an idea of what's on the site where and what the massing will be. Uh, so in the upper left, we have an aerial view from the, uh, from the west looking east to the building. So the existing building is there to the left. Um, and then a proposed parking garage there on the right. We think, uh, we think there's going to be open public parking in front of the garage, so it's probably set back a little more. We don't know what the facades look like yet. That's going to be a little bit down the road. Um, but you can see there's some at least ideation of uh, on the lower left, you see the view, aerial view from the inner belt. We realize that's going to be a prominent elevation, so we want to be thoughtful about what that is, and obviously that will go through uh, city planning like anything else. Uh, just for a just point of verification <laughs> here, the uh, area where the garage is being proposed, mm -hmm. has that property been secured? Yes, all the property has been secured. The entire footprint? The entire footprint, yes. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. Um, another aerial view, this from the uh, northwest corner. Um, the, the main takeaway from this, you know, we don't know what the signage is going to look like. We don't know what the public art is going to look like yet. But the main takeaway is that the architectural character will be, uh, will be respected as we move into modernizing the facility. OK. Uh, just a very preliminary site plan. Again, we think the garage is going to move to the east. There's going to, we're going to make sure we have adequate public parking. Uh, the headquarters storage is going to be on site. Uh, we're working through a lot of options there. So uh, this is very preliminary, but it gets, gives you an idea of, of a site layout. Um, under your, under your uh, presentation, you're assuming that the on-ramp will still be there from the for ODOT, correct? So uh, we are, uh, we have engaged in preliminary conversations with ODOT and uh, their plan is that that on-ramp will ultimately go away. However, the spur connection from the east side of our site up to Superior Avenue would remain. So that piece of road uh, could be a dedicated uh, secured 
piece of road just for the police headquarters. So we wouldn't, once their project is done, which would be after ours, we don't have a timeline for yes. ODOT yet. Uh, once that's done, we would not have the on-ramp adjacent to the building. Okay. Mr. Jones, point, point. On this point here, looking at the RCraft building, you have a track that's on there. And just my suggestion, um, I'm not opposed to this. You know, I, you, the council previously um, talked about traumatization that a lot of our men and women are having on a daily basis. I think having an outlet built in or system built in to help with trauma and the running track, uh, you know, certainly would help that. Um, and then maybe an inside gym. You know, that's really nice. All those kind of amenities, I think, is going to be important for retaining our existing police officers as well as attracting new police officers. So environment matters. Okay. Thank you. Proceed. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, th through the chair to the council member, 100% uh, agree. We are working with CDP, and, and they have the same desire. Um, there is going to be uh, an indoor exercise facility, quiet rooms, things like that, uh, to help with officer wellness. We think the running track on the roof is, is not going to be part of that, but we are looking at a lot of different okay. ways to try to enhance okay. that. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Keep going. All right. Um, when we had our selection criteria uh, through the RFP process, uh, there are, there's a long list of selection criteria, but these are some of the highlights. Uh, one of the most important things was that uh, CDP be the sole occupant. That was a, a must-have. Uh, also, that ultimately the city would have ownership of the facility and the ground. Um, didn't have to be immediate, you know, but ultimately that would be where the, the project would need to go. Uh, we were looking at the best combination of location, functionality, cost, and also just you know, we had the program listed as an attachment to the RFP. It had to be able to meet the program, it had to fit the program. Uh, we were looking at delivery time was one of the criteria, one of the uh, things that we scored. So we were looking for a faster delivery time. Uh, we wanted everything to be on one site and all that program was listed in the RFP. Um, and, you know, we weren't going to do this without support from CDP and public safety leadership. This is their house and they're going to live in it for, as I say, hopefully more than 50 years. So um, we weren't going to go without their support. Um, public accessibility, close to downtown, um, buses, uh, also just operationally being close to, to downtown, the courts, uh, and having uh, quick access to uh, major circulation routes was important. Um, we were also looking for a, a strong uh, development and design team with, with a proven track record on similar projects. Um, you know, we're, uh, it's going to be a long partnership. We're going to work together, and we wanted to make sure that we had a team we had confidence in. Um, and obviously, we were comparing all the potential sites, but just as a quick comparison between the Opportunity Corridor and the Aircraft Building, uh, the Opportunity Corridor design had 180,000 square feet of uh, of building. Uh, the aircraft building, as I mentioned, is 250,000 square feet. And our, our program is about 220, so uh, that we're, we're comfortable with that. That uh, overflow program that I mentioned that wasn't going to fit at the Opportunity Corridor is about 44,000 square feet. That included, among some other things, traffic, narcotics, environmental crime, the police museum, um, storage, uh, some of the evidence than the Fusion Center, which really, uh, really wants to be co-located with the headquarters. Uh, the planned opportunity quarter completion date was fourth quarter of 2026. Um, and the completion of that overflow program was really not known yet because we didn't have locations for it, but we were looking at like 2027 for that. Uh, and of course, this is a reminder, we have the $2.9 million annual lease cost at the Justice Center until we are able to move out. Um, our craft building, as I mentioned, uh, quarter of a million square feet. Uh, we're looking at two years from when we signed the contract. Um, so yeah. it saves a significant amount of uh, time on that lease. Okay. Uh, cost comparisons. Um, the, so you saw the 161 uh, million overall for the, uh, for the Opportunity Corridor site. This is a bit of a breakdown of that. Um, and then the 90 million uh, that's in the legislation today that's uh, that's the project contract cost. Um, there's some potential incentives in there, and we also have contingency in there as well. So the 90 million, is that a complete fit and finish turnkey? So yes, that is the, the project contract cost that we will be having with the developer. There are always 
um, below the line costs associated with every project that include things like moving, like public art is not going to be part of their contract, yeah. things like that. Okay, uh, but uh, what I want to make sure that for the money that we are allocating toward this project, that the division of police is going to be able to move into this building. Yes. Okay, thank you. Proceed. Um, the, uh, the deal structure, a little bit about that. Um, so TurnDev will serve as the project manager. Um, so they will be uh, contracting under their contract the various trades and coordinating and scheduling the work of those trades. Uh, they will be providing um, guaranteed maximum prices for each bid package that goes out. We anticipate probably three such bid packages. Um, the project team includes uh, Turner, Ozan, Vokan is the lead architect, Karpinski is the lead um, MEP, uh, mechanical, electrical, and plumbing engineer, and Barbara and Hoffman is the lead structural engineer. Uh, we are currently working on developing a community benefits agreement and project labor <coughs> agreement. Uh, so those are in process and in discussion uh, in collaboration with OEO um, law and the developer. Um, when, when will that be um, clarified so we know, the council knows? We're in the final stages of uh, negotiating the contract. I don't know if we have a planned signature date yet. John, you have an update on that? Um, are you referring to the, the uh, labor the, agreement? The labor, the, project labor agreement. Yeah. Uh, we've submitted a draft uh, and committed to uh, the full PLA terms requested, so I don't imagine that that's a concern. Okay. Um, in terms of the community benefits, we submitted uh, terms. We received two days ago um, comments back from uh, uh, Chief Epstein, and um, we are evaluating those with our team, and uh, we intend to respond this week to the requests. Okay. Thank you. Keep going. Um, so, uh, yeah, continuing on, we will be uh, paying con uh, construction draws directly. We will be reviewing every construction pay application, so we will have oversight uh, of the project as it moves forward. Uh, we've also engaged uh, a, an owner's rep who will help us do that and compare things against uh, industry standards and so forth, make sure everything's complete and accounted for. And it will be open book pricing, so um, we will know what the breakdown is of all the costs that are proposed. Um, I mentioned the guaranteed maximum price contracts. We will be approving all of those. Um, and uh, the uh, building and land acquisition, as we mentioned, that's um, getting wrapped up. Um, the fixed developer fee will be known. And a lot of times in the developer proposals, you have a bottom line number, but you don't know what they're making, you don't know what their land cost is, but this is all going to be open book, so we'll know all that. Okay. Uh, and then we'll be closing 120 days from C of O. Okay. So we posed, um, and all members should have this, we posed a series of questions to the administration, you, um, and um, you should have all should have received this sheet. Uh, so we'll just jump right down. We, we, we've got, you gave us um, why you selected this building. Uh, you provided, give us some basic um, uh, renderings, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you've indicated the parking garage, the property for the parking garage has been acquired. Mm -hmm. That's a fact. Um, okay, so let's hit, jump right down to number four. Mm -hmm. What will remain in the old third district? on Payne Avenue. Yeah. So uh, once this project and the SWAT project are complete, there will be no more police programs remaining in the third district uh, permanently. That building uh, we anticipate will remain in our portfolio. Um, we don't know what the, the next program of that might be. So everything will be out of the third? That's right. And Chief, is that correct? To the chair, that's correct. Yes, okay. all the operations, our oper current operation, will be moving to this, uh, the uh, new headquarters. So there, is there any decision as to what will happen to that building? Not at this time. Okay. Um, what will be at South High School in yeah. light of the new police headquarters? Okay. Um, so I'm going to just read a little bit of this response here, and then I can elaborate further. Okay, go ahead. Um, the uh, Public Safety Training Center, which will be located at South High School, uh, will include classroom space for police, fire, and EMS, as well as separated classroom areas for CMSD public safety vocational training. Public Safety Training Center will also house the Public Safety Employee Assistance Program, which is currently located at Burke Lake Front Airport. Um, 
this is going to happen in some phases. So uh, under uh, requiring existing requirements contracts, there's work that's already being started there. Uh, that includes um, um, requirements contractor being engaged to conduct initial phase of improvements, including lighting, uh, finishes, abatement in some key areas, HVAC improvements, um, and also they're uh, currently working on creating the connector between the gym and uh, Stella Walsh Recreation Center. Uh, then, so that's phase one, uh, and that's going to enable some initial operations there. And then f for phase two, we plan to engage a construction, a separate construction <laughs> management team um, to be able to go through and, and work on essentially large task orders throughout the project or throughout the facility. Have all the funds been allocated for that? Yes, so there's $5 million allocated for, uh, for the uh, renovations to South High, of which approximately uh, 630000 is dedicated to this phase one uh, that I mentioned, and then the, the rest will be available for phase two renovations. Do we legally own the building at this point? Yes, we do. We do. City, in the, the entire site? Mm. We do. Yes, sir. Okay. So let's move on. Okay. Uh, the status of the location of the SWAT unit. Mm -hmm. Uh, the SWAT unit is planned to move into the former city kennel facility, which is uh, located in the valley by uh, Clark Fields. Um, we actually have a design review meeting that's happening uh, right now or, or in the next couple hours with uh, SWAT leadership and the design team. Um, the building will be completely renovated, including new interior finishes throughout, new roof, new mechanical equipment new lockers and other specialized equipment. Um, it's gonna be upgraded for current code, including storm shelters and other uh, requirements for police facilities. Um, and uh, it will be um, essentially a, a new, new facility in the old shell. Um, and I can talk a little bit about the site selection for that. Well, you need to, because again, the question was, why didn't that go to the third district? Or why wasn't that incorporated into the headquarters? Because mm -hmm. again, we're looking at trying to save money, right. but we're also trying to maximize and provide the best facilities possible for our men and women in blue. So right. someone is going to need to explain that in a little greater detail and have funds been identified for that and where are those where are those dollars coming from? To Chair okay. Councilman, I can speak not necessarily about the funds, but also operationally why the uh, SWAT uh, unit itself is moving to that particular facility. Several reasons. Operationally, it just works better for them to be separate from the uh, headquarters. Okay. Um, they have the ability there to, um, to control access, access to that particular property. Uh, it's not densely populated. Um, uh, in addition, we have the ability to uh, secure the SWAT vehicle and move all of our operations relative to SWAT into one facility. It's just operationally, it just makes sense. Uh, if something were to transpire at uh, a proposed site for the new headquarters, uh, we want to have the ability, the tactical ability, to move our, 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 our SWAT unit and others around, and having them in that facility will be a little bit more problematic, as generally, as you saw a couple years ago with the, uh, the riots downtown, and when it came around to the Justice Center, and if our SWAT unit was there, it would be a little more problematic to get them out into a tactical sound position. Yeah, I, w I will talk to you more offline about that. Um, where, where are the dollars coming from to do the renovation? The, uh, the dollars are in our 2024 bond request as part of the um, uh, public facilities bonds. So that hasn't come before us yet? No, mm -hmm. not yet, sir. Do you have an idea what that is? How so much? It's about 6.5 million. 6.5 million? Mm -hmm. That's a lot of money. It is, although an est we were also looking at options for a new facility, which would have been 12 to 15 million. Uh, recognizing this is, you know, SWAT facility is pretty specialized, as I mentioned, there's pretty high code requirements, um, garage requirements, and so forth. Uh, so, yeah, it's a, it's a it's a specialized facility, and um, this is this okay. is definitely you know about half or, or less than, than building a new one. Well, obviously, we'll have more discussions along those lines because that has not been officially presented to us. But in the course of doing our due diligence on this, um, I wanted to make sure that we're looking at the big picture of CPD. Okay, let's go on. Mm -hmm. The status of the mounted unit. Yeah. Um, so the new mounted unit stables are planned to go between Thackeray Avenue and Hawthorne Avenue in the um, so-called Poet Streets area, east of uh, East 59th Street. Um, and design is scheduled to be completed in June for that. Um, we did consider numerous mm -hmm. sites uh, for that beginning in, in 2018. Seven sites were studied for uh, site and building fit plan, and two were stu studied in depth uh, for both design and cost, including the selected site. 
Um, the reasons for selecting that site, um, you know, what we need for the Mount of Police Stables is a six plus acre contiguous site uh, that's flat, unoccupied, available, um, and is either remediated or remediatable to uh, a level that's adequate for grazing, pasturing, and also uh, is geotechnically stable enough for, for building on. It also needs to be close to downtown, uh, close to some major circulation routes. It's also would preferably be a relatively quiet site, which is those things seem kind of contradictory, so there's, there's not a lot that meet all those criteria. We needed something that was either owned by the city or immediately available, and then of course, the, if it, we had to buy it, the cost of that would be, have to be considered in it as well. And also that no other development was imminent or, or in progress, um, and no uh, adjacencies that would be uh, conflicting. Um, in addition to that, there's a lot of other sort of lesser criteria like making sure that there's adequate site circulation that you can pull through with trailers and, and supplies and so forth. Um, so that's kind of a quick synopsis of the site selection for the model. So um, who's, um, educate us all, whose ward is that? That's Ward 5. Ward 5, okay. Um, have you spoken to the council representative in we Ward have. 5? And the council person is on board? Uh, Mr. Mr. Yeah, Chairman, yeah, well, I'm asking. That's yeah, Mr. Chairman. So we're we're um, working through a community process, um, and the next step is to visit the stables, with not uh, to visit an existing yeah. stable with the councilman at the end of March. So um, okay. I I cannot say that the councilman's on board with this idea, but I can say that he's willing to visit the stables at the end of the month to have continued the I conversation. Will, I will briefly call upon a councilman who's very engaged in his community. Um, so I just want a clarification. So we are pretty sure <coughs> to the administration that the existing site, the existing site of the stables, is within the, the ODAT plans. We, we are sure that it is. It is. There's and no question about that. And we know and they're moving forward? We don't know the timeline. We know they intend to move forward. In addition to that, the existing stables is intrinsically inadequate. It's not a place that we would like to keep the horses any longer than we need to. Okay. Chief, how many horses do we have? To the chair, I believe we have approximately seven horses currently. How many riders? To the chair, three. As of now, three? Yes, yeah, so we're in the process of evaluating up. Uh, Possibly putting up two additional officers in there. Because I was told you just had one. That's what I'm trying to understand. Uh, we had one rider. To the chair, we have three people assigned there. There's currently one person's riding. One yes, rider sir. on a horse. Okay. So, um, so um, we've been hearing about the Interbelt plan for a decade, if not longer. So you're telling us that that's this table, you believe that ODOT is going to ultimately do this? Because, again, you're talking... Um, what's the estimated cost of this facility? Uh, I believe it's about 13 million. 13 million for the mounted unit. Okay. That's a lot of horse feed, man, let me tell you right mm -hmm. there. Okay. 13 million. Okay. Councilman Starr, briefly, we'd like to hear from you, sir. <clears throat> hey, hey, Dean and um, members of council, as well as everyone at the table. Um, we did host a meeting around February 7th over at Vocational Guidance Services. Uh, we had about almost 35, 40 residents um, present, and it was actually the design team from um, the administration came over and presented the mounted unit stable. Um, I will definitely tell you that within the room, um, it was about a 50-50 split between the residents of who supported the mounted unit going over there on, on Thrackery, off of Hawthorne, off of East 55th, close between Central and Cedar. Um, I would definitely want to put out there for, for, for the table that um, upon the completion of that meeting, um, those residents that live on Thackeray, they hit my phone up saying that they do not want the mounting unit 
in their backyard, from the Taylor's family to a couple of different other families. Um, there's about four or five different um, residents that currently live on that street. And some of the things that they reached out to me as well as a follow-up was asking about possibly exploring different housing development over in that land as opposed to the mountain unit. So what I mean by 50-50, you know, once you host a meet in and you bring residents, it may be residents that may live on 70th and Cedar, 74th and Cedar, but those who live right in close proximity, they were the ones who um, text my phone and said, can we move the mountain unit? stable um, because they think there was not a good location. So one of the things I've been doing myself is looking at different <laughs> options and I wanted to ask to the chair, um, to the table, uh, what is about an optional as far as um, the police headquarters, don't we want the mounting units to be in close proximity of that as one question and then also to the protecting part uh, from the current locations where they are at, I know there are some tennis courts that haven't been used. If that's an option that we could possibly explore, having the mounting unit stable there so it could be close to the headquarters um, as well as okay. an opportunity to be able to know that it's not in the neighborhood. I think one of the biggest concerns I heard from the meeting is um, why well, put a mountain unit stable and horses in our community uh, right where we live and land that has not been developed, but also when you look at the history, there used to be a lot of homes over there. Yeah. Um, and I learned that from my colleague, Councilwoman Gray. She gave me some updates back in the day about how that was um, before my time. And I'm just thinking is if we move to moving the mountain unit is is there another location we can look at? Because I don't want my supervisors, the residents, um, to keep chewing me up, asking me to make this move. Some of them also voiced their concern that um, they wasn't there at some of the earlier meetings when it was going on. Obviously, I was not in office at the time period. So one of the things, like I said, those immediate uh, residents that live in proximity were not pleased with it, um, that are the homeowners. They said they do not want to have that right next to their house. Um, and if you, look, if you understand the neighborhood, it would be the mountain unit right there, and then right in the back of it is a house then another house, then across the street, there are two or three different houses. Okay. I, I appreciate your observation, Councilman, because the Councilman has spoken to me about this. And, um, and I will just say this, Councilman Harrison has a point uh, before I call upon Councilman Harrison. Um, talking to officers, they can understand why it's not within a proximity of downtown. They don't understand why we're taking it out because the main utilization of the mounted unit historically has been downtown, even though Many of in a day when you had a mounted unit of size, they would come out into our neighborhoods and patrol our parks and playgrounds. <coughs> My colleagues here would know that, but I remember those days. But that's when you had a big mounted unit. Um, so the question is, we own land to the east of the FBI headquarters up on Lakeside. Mm -hmm. um, and again, based on a $13 million cost figure, which that's the first time I've heard that number, um, I think there's, there's got to be some meeting of the minds here. We've got to make wise decisions. So I'm going to stop there, Councilman Harrison. You had a point. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, briefly, you know, I, I wholeheartedly agree that I don't, you know, from day one, I, didn't, I never thought that this should have been uh, where it is being considered uh, today over on 55th. I mean, it just makes no sense, right? We've had a long discussion around this, um, what, three, four years ago, three, four years ago. Um, but nonetheless, there was a question asked whether we are we sure that ODOT, this current, the current stable site falls within the ODOT uh, plan area. And the answer to the chair to the, from the table was, it is, correct? Mm -hmm. So what happens to the chair to the city's uh, public works facility that's that is next door in the ODNR facility that is next door uh, the, plus the uh, another I think another city facility all lined up on the yeah, same street so yeah. are you telling us uh, to the chair to the administration that all of those entities will be rerouted and moved that, that sit uh, you know along the same uh, path there um, Mr. Chairman of the Councilman um, <clears throat> I'll, I'll defer to Commissioner DeGenero with a little bit more detail, but um, my understanding from ODOT is that they need to take the uh, mounted police stable to flatten out Dead Man's Curve. I have never been informed that the other buildings 
um, at that location need to be removed as well. Um, Commissioner, are you aware of any additional details? I, I've seen a preliminary list of affected sites um, to the chairman or to the councilman through the chair. I don't have it with me. This portion of the project, um, the, the flatten of the, of the interbelt curve, I believe, has not yet been funded, but it's Correct. definitely going to happen. So they may not, or that may not, may not be aware of exactly what's going to be removed or what's going to be able to stay. Okay. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and, and just closing on my point is just that I think we need to really do our due diligence on that, on that aspect. Uh, although that it is a potential impacted site, you know, what, you know, we need further uh, details on what that potential, potentially impact is. It may be a, a, a small, small as a portion of the parking lot is taken away. And, you know, having that information will help this body determine whether, in fact, we need to uh, revert back ordinances that we passed previously allowing this site to go here if it is, in fact, not, does not have uh, community support in this area where it is going, and we know that there's going to be a, a very minimal impact to the current facility uh, that we, we currently have or any other land that we have adjacent to these sites or, you know, in, in, a, in close proximity. Um, that may be impacted by ODOT's plans, all of those things need to be considered, uh, Mr. Chair, before we uh, move anything else around the stables uh, forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Councilman. Uh, Harrison brings up very valid points. Has the $13 million been allocated? Um, through the Chairman and the Councilman, so the money has been allocated for the site preparation that already went into the, the current site. Um, and money for the construction of the stables has not yet been allocated. So that would have to come be before us? It, it would have to come before is, you. And yes. Is ODOT going to pay us $13 million for the property? So ODOT, um, to answer uh, Mr. Harrison's question, is, is very conservative with when they offer to buy your property, I can, I can tell you. So they have agreed to do a, what they call an advanced um, acquisition, meaning they know that they need to take the whole property and therefore they've told us that they'll go ahead and buy it in advance of when the project would move forward. Um, what the exact amount of that would be, um, we don't know. We have old numbers from years ago, so they would have to update that. They would pay for relocation costs associated with moving from one location to the other. You know, typically that includes moving equipment, yes. reestablishing, letterhead, all, all the typical things that fall under the Uniform Relocation Act. Well, if it's going to cost us 13 <coughs> million, we're going to move on on our list of questions. If it's going to cost us $13 million to build a new police stables, as you've indicated, then they have to make us whole because we're there now. Mm -hmm. We're there now. And obviously the building is old, but the building can be renovated. Um, and there is a pasture area for the horses at present, because I've been there. Mm -hmm. So uh, again, they, they cannot take our mounted unit and not make us whole. And I would hope that the administration would, because you're going to have to come back before us, and I can tell you that's going to be the questions around this table, because authorizing $13 million is a lot of money in light of the condition of the district houses, the, five the four police districts. Um, excuse me, the five police districts, I keep, always keep thinking of the headquarters, but the five police districts, look at the condition that the districts are in. So it's going to be a tough sell. That's why I'm, I'm Councilman Harrison and Councilman Starr and others have mm -hmm. raised questions. So again, we're, we're trying to get the big picture. So mm -hmm. let's move on. Understood. Uh, what will remain in the Justice Center with this proposal before us? Uh, to the chair. Um, the uh, central charging will remain at the Justice Center, uh, and that operationally needs to be there because it's uh, integral with the, the courts. Uh, the unit works directly with the courts on a daily basis. Uh, so there's a, a small office of approximately 1,000 square feet that would remain there. Okay. Um, and we'll continue to pay rent for that space. Uh, I don't, do we pay rent for this? I don't know. To the chair, we haven't worked that into agreement, but I would believe, yes, we, we but it's only a small uh, footprint we'll have there. We're going to need to understand what the county is going to hit us up for that space, okay? Okay, let's move on. Uh, the Cleveland Police Museum, where does, is that going? Uh, to the chair, I, I should note that the Cleveland Police Museum is its own organization. Right. Um, but we are providing, uh, we are planning to provide space on the first floor of the new police headquarters okay. for them to uh, okay. fit out if, if they Fine. choose Thank to. Thank you. Uh, ports and Harbors will remain at Burke Airport, Ports and Harbors unit. 
We, uh, we, we technically don't have a Ports and Harbor unit anymore. Uh, it was a collaboration between the uh, county sheriff department and uh, other municipalities. So, Chief, you're telling, wait a minute, you're telling we have no more Ports and Harbor, we ha who's manning the police boat? That's through our uh, northern border, border initiative. So we do have officers assigned there as well as a sheriff department and other municipalities. They're all involved in the, this so, northern border initiative. So there are, there's no more Cleveland Police Ports and Harbor unit? No, we have not had a Ports and Harbor unit in, in a while. Again, we do have the northern border initiative and where we go out with other municipalities. Do we have police officers assigned to that? Yes, sir. How many? <coughs> Three? Yeah, three um, officers are currently assigned there to the chair, the and, council members. And they're physically located down there? They're on call, so they're not okay. physically. They're, the three okay. officers are on call. Okay, we'll talk more about that offline. Um, the contractors and builders of the headquarters, explain this. Uh, to the chair. Proposed the, contractors and builders. Correct. The, uh, the proposed uh, construction management team uh, comprises TurnDev uh, and Ozan. The trade contractors have not yet been identified. Um, obviously, we're not under contract yet. Yes. You know, it's going to be a, a, a process of developing design uh, and then bidding it out and getting getting pricing. The uh, the trade uh, contracting team uh, will be reviewed by the city and will be developed in conjunction with OEO and in accordance with the PLA and the CBA. Okay. But we don't know who those are yet. Okay. So the uh, to Mr. Penny, who are the principals of Turn? Is it Turn Dev? Yes, sir. Who are the principals of that? Um, Ron Lenhart and me. Okay, just the two of you? Uh, yes. Okay, okay. Um, okay, let's move on. And then, because I know my colleagues have questions. Um, let me see. Um, okay. Developer for the project. Um, Do we have any estimated how many construction jobs will be created by this? Um, in excess of 300. For the course of the project? For the Turn course of the project, correct, sir. About 300, okay. And we will, the, pro the, the project labor agreement, that's going to be coming back to us shortly, I'm assuming, right? Yes? It's, it, we, we can submit that. Yeah. Yep, we want to see that. Okay. Um, Okay, uh, our diversity goals, um, and you're going to be coming back with that as well, correct? So we'll have an idea. You've indicated who your contractors are and your, um, the people who are part of this development. We want to make sure, you know, our emphasis on Cleveland residents, diversity, et cetera, et cetera. So the administration will be coming back, correct? For the diversity goals? Yes. yes. Okay. That's what we need to know. Um, and we'll know who all the firms that are, we're going to know all the firms that are engaged in this process and their principals, the principals of the companies, correct? Okay. Uh, uh, to Go the ahead. chair, th there will be, um, we anticipate that there will be three major uh, construction packages. So as each one of those is developed, we'll know who that particular team is and we can still. Okay. Those. Because this is a, again, according to your, figures, this is a $90 million project, correct? Correct. We want to make sure that Cleveland residents, Cleveland businesses benefit from this project. Okay. Um, I'm going to stop there, um, and I'm going to open up for questions at this time. I have, um, I'm going to call upon the two chairs, <coughs> Councilman Harrison, and then, uh, so me. Okay. Thank you, uh, Council uh, Polinzik, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, you, you, you have uh, thoroughly touched some of the uh, questions that um, I had. I know that the body had submitted questions to the administration ahead of time, and some of my uh, questions were answered through uh, those responses, so I appreciate that. Uh, through the chair to the administration, uh, you mentioned that you all are working with um, the administration, well, not, Mr. Penny, to go through the CBA um, piece for this um, police headquarters, and you received some feedback from Chief Epstein already uh, regarding some of those aspects. Through the chair to the administration, do you have a timeline of when you believe that will be worked out or, or have some sort of um, maybe 
joint under agreement or semi agreement between the developer and the administration. But when that council will see that, who can answer that? I ask that because Mr. Chairman, and Mr. Chairman, I asked that question because what I hope we're not going to do is is approve the deal and then do the CBA on the back end, right? Like we like we've been uh, accustomed to do um, in in the past. You know, I hope that that is going to be at the forefront versus at the end of the uh, process. We want guarantees. Okay, whoever can answer that. John, you want to talk yep. about that? Um, so the administration's made clear from day one that executing a, a community benefits agreement is a condition to closing. Okay. So it's stated in all the agreements uh, that the transaction does not close unless the CBA is executed simultaneously. Um, if you look at historically turn devs, OEO participation, our performance, uh, we feel that we set the, the standard to be candid. Um, on our headquarters project on Superior, we, we don't just agree or insert into our contracts a good faith obligation. We mandate that our teams actually perform. Sure. And so I think we had over 35% participation rate on our uh, a $50 million project there. And um, so the administration made it clear that um, this CBA would go beyond that, and um, we received comments a few days ago. We distributed to our team all of the uh, the comments. I would hope by the end of next week to have um, an agreement in principle and, and put that one uh, to the side. And I also believe that um, the labor participation terms were acceptable, so we're very close on that. I think we just have to finalize uh, the development agreement, and those are discussions that are ongoing, but we're very close on that. Good. Thank, thank you, you uh, Mr. Penny. Uh, thank you, administration. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I I'll stop there. You know, I'll turn it over to uh, Chairman. Um, <laughs> back to you, sir. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, Councilman Bishop, you've indicated that you're fine. Thank you, as always. Um, I have uh, Councilman um, Jones and then Councilman Harsh, and everyone's going to get their 15 minutes. So, um, and I'm keeping track, okay? Use some of Mr. No, you're time. not. Go ahead. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> He's already given me. Yeah. So, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't hear that. So We're going to use yeah. parliamentary procedure. Yeah, yeah you're, you're, you're talking to the chair here. So 15 minutes, get going. <laughs> well, first going. of all, I just think that, the you know, looking at this project, one of the concerns that I had <laughs> and it was answered was the difference between um, the art craft project and the opportunity corridor. Um, the only concern that, that um, or the questions I would have is that with the current um, headquarters site right now, the mounted unit is nowhere near that, is it, Mr. Chairman, to the director? We had that discussion while you were out. That, that's okay. That's yeah. my okay. question now, so they can answer it again. To, to the chair, that it's, uh, I don't have the mileage, but it's obviously right on the shore way at about 40th, I believe, and uh, headquarters is currently at, at 1300 Ontario. And so in, in the discussion, Mr. <coughs> Chairman, um, to, um, uh, to whomever, right, um, there was $13 million that you talked about. To the chair, councilman, approximately $13 million for the new site, if approved. Um, well, if you approve, it would be $13 million for estimated. a new estimated. unit. Estimated. Estimated. That's estimated, correct. And, and you want to keep, Mr. Chairman, to the chief, that particular uh, site um, located near downtown? To the chair, well, ideally, I'd like to have something relatively close to downtown, but I, I don't want it lost that even in our current location on the shore with the mounted unit, the horses are actually, uh, they're, they're trailered out to the neighborhoods, as you mentioned, uh, to the chair. Uh, so they don't ride from downtown to the neighborhoods. Uh, they do ride from uh, the current location into downtown Cleveland. They're not trailered there for the most part. Uh, sometimes they are, but if they're going out to the neighborhood in Collinwood, for example, they're trailered out there. And if they're going out to the neighborhood from, if approved, the, the, the facility on 55th, they would be trailered out to those particular neighborhoods as well. So I think ideally, uh, the site uh, is, I think is, is ideal as it stands right now. Um, taking consideration that several other sites were looked at and evaluated, and this was the site that we believe was the best site. But however, um, if uh, the community is not uh, uh, willing or want that particular site, then obviously we have to reevaluate that location. How big is the site that you're looking for in terms of location? I believe approximately five to six uh, uh, um, acres. I'll, I'll turn it over to Carter. Through the, through the chair yes. of the councilman, about six and a half acres. Okay. And 
And then the next question I have, Mr. Chairman, um, with the, the next issue was uh, an additional five million that would be spent for um, 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 the SWAT unit. Um, was the SWAT unit uh, initially uh, next to, um, or was it a part of the, the old headquarters? So through, uh, Go ahead, Carter. Whoever can through, answer. Through, through the chair of the council member, the, um, the SWAT unit was uh, originally part of the entire suite of programmatic elements uh, associated with the headquarters. However, and we actually considered uh, co-locating it with the headquarters and uh, could potentially have the room to do that at the, at the proposed location. However, operationally, there was a strong desire by CDP to not co-locate co SWAT with the headquarters as a sort of security redundancy uh, and ability to respond if there's protests in front of the headquarters or something like that. Um, so we do want to co-locate SWAT with itself. So right now, uh, the SWAT offices and, and the uh, SWAT vehicles are in three separate locations. So in order to respond, they have to, uh, I understand, go to the offices, they go to the, get their vehicles, and, but we want all of that in one in one spot, obviously, for, for response reasons. Thank you. Councilman Jones. And, and Mr. Chairman, um, you know, we, we've had a chance as council to go over to the actual site location and take a look at that, at that location. And I've heard testimony this morning that um, uh, uh, I guess all parties feel that uh, the shell that we have is um, a very solid bones, if, that, if I can use that terminology. Uh, and that um, you will have the capacity to uh, renovate the entire facility. Is that correct? That is correct. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Chairman, my next question is workforce. Um, we sat here at this table and gave $10 million out to workforce development. And I asked them one question, and that was one question, what are you going to do different than you have done 10 years previously. And I didn't get not one response out of all the people who were going to be receiving the money. And, and that's number one. And then number two, they didn't even dignify this table of counsel to give us an executive portfolio to break down how that $10 million is going to be spent. Um, so when it comes to doing the rehabilitation <laughs> of this particular building, are you going to be working with um, um, contractors and, and workers uh, who live and reside in the city of Cleveland? Uh, so uh, let me uh, kind of address uh, the first part and I'll, I'll let uh, John whoever, address some. Yeah, whoever so can answer I, let me talk first uh, through the chair to the council member about what, what are we doing different. And um, what's different here is traditionally uh, the approach to uh, labor participation to oil participation has been that simply there are established percentage goals that really relate to company ownership and um, bidders submit and they're either given a good faith effort or not and then they obviously have to, to uh, follow up with their reporting of what's going to those subcontractors. What's different here is partly just by the nature of the way this was project is being delivered, as opposed to just sort of blindly going out to bid, we're able to work with the developer to help them develop their team in conjunction with OEO and the project labor agreement and the community benefits agreement. Those are things that we have not traditionally had in our projects. So it's a much more proactive and integrated approach between us, OEO, and the developer to make sure that, uh, like John said, it's not just uh, we check the box for good faith effort, but that it's really happening for real on the job site. Uh, John, would you like to elaborate any more on that? Uh, I, everything you, I agree with everything you said. Um, we've been asked to commit to a contractual obligation to a minimum threshold of, um, of resident participation. <coughs> I think we're evaluating that to determine if we can meet or exceed it. Um, the challenge is, um, are there available trades that uh, we can bring onto the project that are, number one, have capacity to work a two-year two project? There's a lot of work. There's a lot of people who are busy. And, um, and also, do they have the skill set to be able to participate in the project? But we have asked our team to um, go as far as they possibly can, and the administration is pushing us as far as we can. So um, I think we're probably a week out from finalizing the, the community benefits terms. 
And, and uh, you know, first I'd like to thank you for, you know, including that. One of the biggest things that's been uh, ongoing here in the city of Cleveland, unfortunately, is that we have a lot of development that's happening, but we don't have a lot of citizens in the city of Cleveland actually participating in that, nor do we have small businesses and minority-owned businesses um, engaged. And so when they don't find and they cannot find work, they move away from the city of Cleveland. So as an elected officials, one of the responsibilities, I believe, is is to try to make sure that we retain our existing residents and then try to grow new ones coming into the city of Cleveland. So with that being said, I'd like to talk to you offline because we're, we are doing something about that uh, in my neighborhood. And we're putting together systems and would love to uh, have you come to one of our events to talk about the, the opportunities and jobs that are available uh, for people who want to get jobs in addition to uh, contractors and small contractors that can do work in terms of construction. Okay. Um, just the next just question. A, just a point. Uh, Councilman Starr, you had a point. I've got Councilman to pause. Yes, thank you, Ch uh, Chair. Thank you, Councilman Jones, for allowing me for a point. Um, my point that I would just like to ask, um, I hear this phrase the last 15 months, good faith effort. And I've had projects come in my neighborhood, and when I look up and talk to OEO, the good faith effort ain't even working with them. Okay. So what I wanted to ask to the chair, to the table, what does we mean when we say good faith effort? Because if you're not working with OEO closely on ensuring that we um, issue out those contracts or those, those opportunities to um, write up for a proposal, I, I don't think that's a good faith effort or just sending out an email to, to a, a um, general contractor or some subcontractors. I don't think that's a good faith effort Thank because you. there's other ways of forms of communication to get that message out. So my, my question to the chair to the table, can you elaborate on what a good faith effort is? Please do so, and then I'm, Councilman Jones is back up. Uh, through the council, uh, through the, to the chair to the council member, I don't want to speak for OEO uh, and their internal process, but uh, just to, to let you know what, what it means when we say a good faith effort. When we put a project out to bid, uh, each bidder has to submit, along with their bid, backup documentation of who all of their subcontractors are. So there might be a, a general contractor might have, you know, an electrician, masons, all these other subcontractors working for them. So they have to submit these schedules that show who they are and what certifications they have in terms of CSB, MBE, FBE, and they have percentage goals to meet. Um, <clears throat> And that varies depending on if it's professional services or public improvement or whatever. That's all uh, codified. But the um, so they they have to either show that they meet all those goals, the percentage goals of hiring subcontractors with those qualifications, or if they don't, they have to uh, say acknowledge that they didn't, and then demonstrate how they tried to make those to meet those goals and what reasons they couldn't. That's also, when we receive the bids, the first thing we do is we take that package and submit it to OEO for them to evaluate. So then OEO goes through those schedules and says, uh, yep, they, they met the goals in terms of MBE, FBE, CSB participation, or they didn't meet the goals, but they really put forth a serious effort to try to, and there were circumstances that they couldn't meet them, or they didn't make a good faith effort. So they have to evaluate based on what the contractor submits to determine if they made a good faith effort. Okay. okay. And, and just uh, and I'll, I'll add you to, to end, and just to end it. Okay. Um, is there, through the, through, our, through the chair, can we ask our um, research team to possibly pull up the, um, the penalty if they don't reach those goals as far as legislative? Because I, I would love to see what is the actual penalty on projects when, you know, General contractors or developers do not reach those those goals through OEO or through Charter 187, 188. So, okay. yeah. so like I, I just, can just add, add you more to this, but I will direct that to the staff if you can pursue that to both of our staff. Uh, and you, on that point, Mr. What? Chairman, before okay. you start me up, just okay. on his point, because okay. you should freeze my time and keep it froze. Yeah. Uh, uh, Mr. Yeah. Chairman, to... Uh, yeah. <laughs> They'd like to freeze yeah. you around the table, okay? But anyway, keep going. I'm going to tell you how I feel. You might not like it. Uh, Mr. Chairman, to um, the distinguished gentleman star, I think you really hit a really key point. And that is how we operate our processes here in the city of Cleveland to be more inclusive to our, our citizens. And so I think we need to do a deeper dive in that. Okay. And I think that starting with our staff, uh, we can start pulling the information and analysis of that. Uh, there are cities like Atlanta that said you can do no development in our city unless 50% of, of your people who are 
50% uh, uh, of the citizens are involved and engaged in that. And that was under Mayor Jackson, his program. Okay. So, and that city has developed, uh, in, in fact, there's so many people moving into Atlanta, they can't even keep up. Okay. So with that being said, Mr. Chairman, um, to Mr. Starr, I think we need to look at that. Okay, you're back on time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first, I'd like to commend the administration, but before I do that, I got to ask some questions first. And that is, how much was the existing cost of what we were going to spend on the corridor? How much was it? Is it the 161 million that we're talking about that's down here at the bottom? How much money was allocated or budgeted for spending uh, at the, the Opportunity Corridor before we changed over to the Arcraft okay. location? Respond. Okay. Uh, through the chair to the council member, the $161 million is the, um, in t the total project cost estimate to do everything for the police headquarters um, if with the main headquarters was at the Opportunity Corridor. So that includes stuff that needed to be located elsewhere, you know, that's, that's all in what we were looking at. If we were to plow forward with that plan, where it would end up. Um, what was allocated in a 2018 bond issue of uh, 55 million and a 2020 bond issue of 60 million um, were allocated for the police headquarters for uh, an initial total of uh, obviously 115 million. Of that, five million has been allocated to the um, South High Public <laughs> Safety Training Center, as we as we mentioned earlier. How much? Five million. Okay. Um, and to date, we have uh, spent approximately 9.5 million. That includes site acquisition, uh, some site improvements. It includes uh, professional services. Uh, many of those professional services are design services that we're still able to leverage at the new location, so it's not all sunk cost. Um, but uh, does that does that answer the you know, the question? Well, it does and it doesn't, right? You're saying that right now you have an estimate of 161 million, right? So 161 million you really had estimated for this site, and were you looking to the question is, are, what was the total allocated budget for this particular site? Through the what, council, to what what was passed by city council? Uh, he said 100. He said no, no, no. It wasn't 161. Yeah. Okay. Then you're right. Go ahead. Okay. So uh, through the through the chair to the council member, uh, the ordinances that authorized the 2018 and 2020 um, bond issuances for police headquarters actually authorized higher levels than were actually issued at that time, but it was the the total of the two issuances was 115. Right. Okay, so the so you so you you would not have been able to get this project off that you have on the books unless you went back out for another bond. Uh, to through the chair to the council member, that's correct, or or made a, or made a major adjustment to the project. I see. So then, so we had 115 million ideally right now to operate off of, of which you're saying that your projected cost is 90 million. Is that correct? That is correct. And you're going to try to stay within that budget and not have it overrun. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. So what is your ideal savings? Is the difference between the $90 million, um, proposal that we're seeing in front of us um, uh, versus the 161 it would have cost us, or is it the 115? Uh, through, the, through the chair to the, to the uh, council member, uh, the 115, uh, that includes the 5 million for the uh, Public Safety Training Center. Uh, it does include some sunk costs. The, um, as I mentioned, there are some below the line costs like the public art moving, things like that, um, which we're also identifying. Um, but this project contract itself, what's on the table today, uh, would be the 90 million. And the last question I have, how much are you saving um, the city of Cleveland with this project per versus the, the initial Opportunity Corridor project? Director, or director whoever can answer that question. Yeah. So um, the, the difference would be the, the 61.1 million, right? So what's yeah, the difference? Well, wait a minute. Make, the, make sure you're giving us the right number now because right, obviously we, you didn't give us the right numbers last time as it pertains to what this was going to cost us. Yeah, so <clears throat> we have a $90 million budget with TurnDev. We have uh, 9.5 million sunk costs. <clears throat> Where's the total for? So is it 71 million? Yeah. So Listen up, everybody. Here's, here's the sunk costs. Here's the 5 million. Yeah. Here's the 115 that was allocated. Yeah. 
So the total budget they're saying would be 90 plus the nine. Get out your calculators if yeah. need be. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Whoever can answer the question. Okay. We're going to follow up with you with finance. Go. I don't want to give the wrong number. Yeah, right? that's okay because because right. you didn't give us the right number last time. Correct. See, and see, okay. I was trying to work with him, Mr. Chairman. Trying to be nice sitting here. I see. And so now, the the issue is. If, if you're saving based on these these mm -hmm. numbers that you've projected in front of me, it right. looks like 71 million. You know that would actually be a savings to the city of Cleveland, which of course this side of the table is really happy about. So, Mr. Chairman, I'll wait um, until they have the actual numbers. Um, what I do like about this is that you're saying at least with the 90 million here that this is hard, which means that we're not looking to go. And I'm going to stress that again because I know the chairman did it. Uh, and we talked about this previously, uh, that this is a hard stop. We're not looking to go over that amount. Is that correct, Mr. Chairman, to Mr. DeRosa? That's correct. Yes, okay. hard stop. M Mr. Chairman, to, to the administration, I, I, um, I um, give the, 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 Thank you, Councilman Jones. You had 37 seconds left. Man, <laughs> I'm going to. I'm going to give you a star today. Okay. Um, I have on the list, I have Councilman Harsh, Gray, and I have Councilman Harsh, Gray, and Star. Anyone else? Look, McCormick and Slife. And you don't. Okay, I'll. Okay. Star wants off. Uh, Ms. House, you want to go on? Okay, wait, is it a point? Just through the. Um, Chair to the director, yes. um, this will be a building or a property that we will own, correct? Um, yes. Yes. To okay. The and to the, the chair yes. to the um, director, um, how are we um, allocating for uh, proper and effective maintenance of the building that okay. we're owning? Okay. Can, can you you want to address, address that now or later, so she can, because. I don't know who can answer a maintenance question. Um, yeah, we don't. Um, it, through, so, do you have an through, answer? Yeah, through, through, through the chair to the uh, council member, we would develop a capital maintenance program for this uh, as part of the overall public safety portfolio of, of facilities. Uh, we're going through right now some uh, assessments. We're going to be doing the, for example, the fire station modernization yep. assessment. Um, so this would roll into that and then we would have annual capital allocations for capital maintenance. Now, in addition, there's day-to-day -day property maintenance, which is yeah, okay. not part of capital, but, but that would also okay. be Okay, thank you. Right. Thank you very much. Yeah, so just through the chair to the director. Yes, listen up. That um, maintenance is outside of just the, the deal that's being yeah. presented today. That yes. is something that is separate and apart apart from that, right? That is correct. Okay. okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, again, we have Councilman Harsh, Gray, McCormick, and Slife. Anyone else? Okay, Councilman Harsh, you got your 15 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Chairman Polensic, Harrison, and Bishop for having a joint committee today. I apologize for being late. The county was rolling out their um, homeless prevention strategy for the next five years. It's an important subject. I wanted to be over there, so I apologize for being late. Um, but we were right where I wanted to be with Councilman Jones' question. So um, just to reiterate through the chair to the director, the 2018 and 2020 ordinances passed by city council to um, authorize bond sales for the police department, for the police headquarters. What was the total amount in 2018 and 2020 that was authorized? I believe it was 63, 64? Oh, authorized? Um, through the chairman and the councilman, I don't have those ordinance here to say what was authorized. We just know what was actually allocated. Okay. Well, we have them, right? They're on, they're available to us as a body and I don't, can we just have somebody, can our research department pull that up real quick and just let us know while we're doing that, we ought to have quick access to our own ordinances, right? Okay. Um, because I believe it was 63 and 64, if I recall, I remember reading them. The, the, Does that sound right, the, chairman? The dollar amount? Yeah. I, 65 I think, and 64? Yeah, I think you're pretty close, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. I would like to know the exact number. If we can, we should be able to find that while I am continue my questions. Through the chair, to the director, what do you mean by we authorize more than issued? Wait, when we issued a certain Councilman, amount. Councilman, if you would hold on. Uh, Kim, 
if you could get uh, uh, Mr. Um, uh, Stephen, get Stephen in here because he had looked at those numbers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Go ahead. When we say that they, we authorized more than we issued, could you explain that to me? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm, uh, to the councilman, I'm not involved with the bond sales, but what it means to me is that the ordinance allowed for the issuance of more bonds than they actually chose, finance actually chose to have issued. And when you say they through the chair, who is they? The finance department. The finance department through the chair, the finance department of the previous administration? Uh, that's correct, sir. Okay. Through the chair, the finance department, when they chose <coughs> to author, when they chose to issue less bonds than authorized, were they making a permanent decision, or can they go back and continue to authorize more, uh, and continue to issue more until they reach that authorization ceiling? Through the chairman and the councilman, I do not know. Through the chair it, to the director, who knows? Uh, through the chairman and the councilman, the finance director. Right. Finance director. Is there anyone can, uh, from the administration can get a hold of the finance director, see if he could come up if he's available? That would be helpful. <clears throat> Thank you. Through the chair to the director, I believe we, authori we authorized it's over 120, somewhere around 125 million in bond sales. And through the chair to the director, I understand if this isn't your department, but I think we ought to know exactly how much was issued. And I'm very confused about how much was issued uh, through because the, we clearly didn't go all the way to the authorization cap. Through the chairman to the councilman, what was actually issued was in 2018 under ordinance 509-2018, $55 million. And in 2020 issued under ordinance 161-2021, $60 million for a total of, of 115 million dollars give us the date the first the first okay. first date again the the first date <clears throat> or the first ordinance number yes um 509-2018 and that was for and that was 55 for, what million. was the date on that do you know i do not know okay that was 55 million yep 2018 and, and the, yep and 60 million and and those add up to 115 million but there you go so through the to, to Mr. Chair, you're holding them now. What was the amount that was um, authorized in 509-2018 and 161-2021? Okay, I have it right here. Great. How much? So 509-18 was 64 million. Okay, so we so we so we issued nine million less than authorized. And then in, um, go ahead. So, so it's not 60 million. You're saying it's 64 million. 65 million, according to the ordinance. Okay, excuse and what me, was excuse well, me, 64 million. 64, correct. And in yes. 161, 2021, how much was authorized? And authorized in that one was 65 million. Okay. And and then we and we we um, we issued 60. So there was five million left on the table there. So we left 14 million on the table from what was authorized to what was issued. So my question to the chair, or through the chair, I'm sorry, is does the finance department have in their legal authority or capacity to issue the remaining 14 million? Or did that ship sail? Um, is, through the chair. <clears throat> I think that's a question that's got to go to the finance. Uh, yeah, I, I don't have the answer to that. Okay. The reason but I we, ask we is that back. my whole life, before getting to City Hall, I sit around and I read stories about cost overruns and cost overruns and cost overruns. And the taxpayers are always on the hook for cost overruns. And I'm looking at a proposal that dramatically shrinks the cost of a new police headquarters, which seems lovely, which seems like a wonderful good thing. Um, but, you know, sometimes things are too good to be true. And I worry about the cost overruns, and I'm very, very concerned through the chair that we're going to come back and have a shortage when we didn't even issue all the bonds that were authorized. So I want to know if there, through the chair, if there is a built in contingency for cost overruns by issuing the authorized yet not issued bonds. And I think that's an important part of the capital stack. And I think that's a very valid question to the administration. So you're going to have to secure that. Sure. Because obviously if this legislation leaves us, it goes to finance, and these some questions will come up at the finance table. Uh, through the chairman of the councilman, that that is um, – Absolutely not how I understand it to work, but I understand your question, and we'll, we'll get back to you. Um, I've never been privy to having a built-in 
uh, Christian for covering of cost overruns. So um, I, I'll have Carter speak to how this particular contract has been set up as a guaranteed maximum price. That might help um, illuminate how we're trying to um, avoid having cost overruns. Uh, through the chair to the council member. Uh, so there are a couple of protections in place within that. So there is a design and construction contingency within the 90 million. Um, so that is, includes some, we, we could call it cushion there that will be internal to the contract. Uh, also with the guaranteed maximum price or GMP delivery method, we will be, uh, unlike a traditional design bid build where the bids just come in and they are what they are. We'll be working with the contractors as they're developing costs so that we can adjust design decisions to make sure we stay within uh, the overall cost uh, projection for the project. Okay. Okay. Wait, okay. Councilman, Councilman Jones had a point specifically on that issue. And let me put him on, let me put Councilman Harsh on pause. Hold on. Okay, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Harsh, um, Councilman Harsh. Because um, that's just the whole point, trying to get the numbers right, right? So of the 509-2018, you, so I'm under the same understanding here. You had the capacity to go 64 million, but you only went out for 55 million. Is that correct? That's correct. And for 161-2021, you had the capacity to go out for 65 million, but you went out for 60 million. Oh, that's correct. Sir. That's it, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank to get you. That right. Councilman, you're back up. Which I think, Mr. Chairman, begs the question of, you know, when we authorize bond issuance, why does the administration get to decide how much we authorize they issue? That's a question I have internally, probably a question for finance. I think, I think that's I a valid, very valid but I, I would think that if we authorize 65 million, that means you're going to issue 65 million, because that was the plan. Right. But, you know, that's apparently not a question for this table right now okay. to answer. My, my, my next question, I only had two, so I was going to take my time. Um, but uh, <laughs> You've got seven minutes left. Okay, great. Then seven minutes will cover one more question. Um, on the last page of the proposal, uh, or I'm sorry, the presentation, on the proposal scores, um, the Artcraft Turner development highlighted column almost laps every other uh, proposal was evaluated. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, but they were evaluated on very favorable <laughs> conditions. Uh, cost, obviously, it's cheaper to use a building that already exists than it is to build a new one. Uh, schedule, it's obviously faster to retrofit a building than to build a new one. Um, location, I think, you know, I, I think the location on Superior is more centrally located. I get that one. My question through the chair to, to the director is this. Why is the community benefit of the, turn, uh, of the art craft building five points higher than a new construction, which ostensibly we ought to be able to make the gold standard of, of, of community benefit? And why is the art craft score so much higher on the facilities criteria when we can build to suit? Like, why would the retrofit be 28 points, but a brand new building would only be 17? Wouldn't we build the same brand new building to be exactly what we want Direct, director, Go ahead. city uh, architect. Through, through, the, uh, through the chair to the council member. Um, yeah, so the, uh, just as a little bit of a process background, the proposals were evaluated by four evaluators independently representing real estate, architecture, and uh, CDP. Um, the community benefit, the, and I'll, I'll go through a little bit of what, what some of the description of these criteria are. Um, the community benefits included commitment to OEO, commitments to sustainability, and then evaluating um, what other things like catalyzing economic development and so forth might be associated with that um, particular location. Um, quite honestly, in terms of the OEO submission, um, the aircraft turn dev proposal was the only proposal that submitted enough uh, OEO information that OEO was able to make a determination of their um, of their uh, OEO participation. Um, they also, you know, we, we obviously, as I mentioned, we don't know who the subcontractors are going to be yet, but we do know that both the developers, the um, lead architect, the structural engineer, the mechanical uh, engineer, are all local Cleveland-based firms, uh, which is uh, unusual in a project of this size. Um, and also the uh, commitment to sustainability uh, and their track record of being able to achieve uh, lead certification on a previous project was very clear in their project or in their proposal. 
Um, so those were the, some of the things that brought that uh, to the fore. And, and also, you know, things like I mentioned the location. So, so I'm sorry, just to interject through the chair. Go so, ahead. Yeah. So, so specifically to community benefit, environmental impact was part of that. So reusing an existing building gets a better environmental score than building a new building. Correct. So that comes into the community benefit score? That's part of it as well, yes. Thank you. To the chair, go on. I'm sorry, I just want to clarify that. This is good. I didn't mean to interrupt. Um, and then let me talk about the uh, facility criteria evaluation uh, a little bit. Um, so the first criteria in there was the compliance with what was Exhibit A to the RFP, which was the program, um, to make sure that everything that we had listed out as a requirement would fit there, um, and um, that we would be the sole occupant and the owner. Some of them just didn't make those criteria. Um, you'll see the, the lowest one, the KRA bluffs, was only five points. It really, it, it, it appeared evident that we just wouldn't fit in the location, so that's sure. a pretty low score. Um, the the show, I'm specifically looking. talking about the opportunity corridor. The idea of building a, you know, your dream come true police department having a lower score and facility criteria seems weird compared to a retrofit. So some of the, uh, and some of the facility criteria that um, bring down the opportunity corridor, that first criterion of having everything that's in the exhibit uh, of, the, uh, of the program on the one site, the opportunity quarter didn't meet that. Hmm. So we would have to have approximately 44,000 square feet of program that would have to be located <laughs> elsewhere if we proceeded with the opportunity corridor design. Um, that also affects program space fit adjacencies. Um, it, the, um, just quite, quite bluntly, the, the compact <coughs> open plan Excuse form me. of the aircraft building provides a lot of flexibility and planning mm -hmm. uh, and helps us meet the adjacencies. Right now, there's a lot of departments within CDP that work together that aren't co-located. Okay. We're able to do that on a floor plate like the aircraft. Um, that's something that bumps that up. Um, code compliance, uh, that's kind of a wash on both of those. Obviously, if we build a new building, it's going to be code compliant. And uh, it was clear that the aircraft building would be made code compliant. Kaufman? Okay. Well, um, to the chair, thank you for that. I appreciate that. That makes a little bit more sense. Um, I do obviously appreciate the notion of keeping the police headquarters downtown. Um, I think it makes sense to keep the police headquarters downtown. That just seems obvious. Um, but selfishly, my kids go to school about a block from this new location. So I really like the idea of the police being a block away from, from, the, from the grade school. That's wonderful. Um, but I think through Mr. Chair, we need to figure out um, what the complete answer is from the finance department on why the authorization does not match the issuance of bond sales, and whether or not they can still issue that remaining gap, if that's direct, an option. Uh, uh, Councilman, direct that to our staff, that question. I want to make sure you have it correct. Because if there's $14 they have million it. left in unissued okay. bonds that were authorized, we should know whether or not that's still in play. Gotcha. Good thank question. You. Good point. Okay. Thank you for keeping time. Okay. Councilwoman Gray. Thank you, Chair. I just have one question. Yes. How, how everybody's doing. Uh, this question is to the architect Carter. Uh, when, when, I, uh, when we walked, um, sorry, when we went on the tour and I walked with you through the entire building, um, and my uh, main question was pertaining to um, chair to Carter to the community. As you know, the previous building that was going to be built on Opportunity Corridor, uh, we had the engagement with uh, our previous chief Williams uh, when uh, they had the structure. They had the structure of of the community engagement activities. How they was going to set everything up. On the um, on the perimeter of around the building where the community will be engaged with, you know, with a lot of activities, and my question to you as we toured the building, you know, will that still be consistent with the uh, constituents coming into the building, partaking with activities or engagement programs, and what have you? And uh, and you stated that. You know, not as much because it's going to be interior, but in the um, but in the uh, but but in this capital project, it's not actually stated if that's still going to be part of the um, part of the you know part of the project, and how much allocation will that still be consistent with the community coming in having a space for them to have at uh, you know. Uh, 
community activities, you know, engagement programs such as educational or as meetings per se. Okay. Chair and to, uh, to whoever can to answer, I'm assuming it's going to be the chief, yeah. but uh, just on that point, we, the, 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 when we designed the third district, we wanted to make sure there was some community engagement rooms in the third district. Yeah, to, to the chair, so, council, uh, yeah, woman, um, council person, Gray. Um, yes, that's uh, we take all that in consideration. Uh, it was taken in consideration for the OC um, uh, headquarters proposal. It's also in consideration uh, here as well. There will be a community room. So we're as we are talking through this, as we've talked through this, it's extremely important that we make sure that we engage with the community, that we have a facility and a, and a space for them to come and engage with the officers, uh, have meetings and so forth. Uh, the only thing that's somewhat different is that at the OC proposal, there are going to be some outside uh, uh, programming for the community, but obviously that's a little more difficult here. But yes, the community was always at the forefront to make sure that we engage with uh, our residents and the community in general. Uh, Council lady? Thank you for that question. I'll be answered. But uh, due to this project, um, I would like to see uh, this committee or per se come into our community meetings and inform the residents of the transition from Octo uh, you know from the October uh, Opportunity Corridor to downtown and what is the expectations of what type of community engagement programs will be in the building because that's an expectation that was so high with the uh, community when they came to Chief Williams' meeting. They really were excited about the new project on the Opportunity Corridor. So now since it's gonna be transitioned and shortened, our, um, our constituents should know the process moving forth on what type of programs will be in that building for them to um, engage with, chair to anyone on a panel. Okay. To, to the chair, the councilwoman, I, I can assure you that I will come out, or my staff will come out and uh, explain the whole process and the difference between OC uh, proposal and this particular pro proposal, if approved through our city council. Thank um, you. Again, I think the biggest difference will be the uh, outside program. Yes. Uh, so, but other than that, everything will remain the same. There will be, a f <clears throat> excuse me, there will be a facility, a meeting room for the community for engagement. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, thank Questions. you, Councilwoman. Thank you for keeping time. Councilman McCormick. Thank you, Chair. Um, Chair, uh, just as a point of clarification, this facility, the proposed facility is larger, correct, than the Opportunity Corridor facility, is that correct, through the chair? Uh, uh, through the chair to the council member, that is correct. The Opportunity Corridor was approximately 180,000 square feet, it's, it's and this is approximately 250. Thank you. Um, chair, to um, the team, I just want to first say I think that this is the right move. Um, I think this, this location makes a lot more sense. It's on a 24-hour transit line. It's centrally located. Um, I also appreciate re, you know, reusing an existing building uh, versus building new, quite frankly, on a, a stretch that was designated for job creation. Um, this is not job creation. This is a critical uh, function for the city, but it is not job creation. So I appreciate, uh, I think this is an important move uh, for the city of Cleveland. Um, Chair, uh, in, again, I've reviewed the um, proposal, and so I, I just I have a lot of thoughts about it, but I'll just let, leave it at that, that I think that this is the right move for the city of Cleveland. Um, Chair to the director, um, or what is your title, Carter? Carter, we're just going with Carter? Uh, Carter's fine. Okay. Um, I'm curious about the connectivity of this facility, especially in non-vehicular access. So, um, Chair to the director, Carter, or to anybody on this, how do we ensure, what are the plans, specific plans, to ensure that folks that are utilizing um, public transportation, non-motorized vehicles, and pedestrians can safely access this site? Whoever can answer, including answers, well, will there be adequate parking for the public? Uh, through, through the council of the chair, uh, so yes, uh, we are planning for uh, 50 uh, public uh, parking spaces, which is, I, I believe, more than we actually had at the Opportunity Corridor and is within the program. Um, but uh, just as importantly, yes, the uh, multiple ways that people will be coming to this are an important consideration in the architectural development of this. Um, and as we're particularly looking at the first floor, um, and a lot of those public 
activities. The first floor is essentially dedicated to public facing activities, whether it's the community room, whether it's records, whether it's the, the police museum. Uh, we want that to be welcoming and accessible in every sense of the word. Um, so there will be an entrance on Superior as well as a rear entrance from the parking that connect through into the middle to a common lobby. Um, that's also, for a variety of reasons, that's a good security look layout, um, but we want to make sure that that path from whether it's the bus, the bike lane, or walking uh, to you go, you don't get shunted around to the back door. You know, you have a, a welcoming entrance that greets you and that is accessible. Um, that is an important part of the architectural design. Thank you. And I would just say to through the chair, you know, what does the um, transit experience look like when you get here? What type of information can residents utilize to understand their best routes to this facility? What type of bike parking, you know, is available? I mean, are those transit information and access and bike parking, are those all assumed to be embedded in this plan through the chair? Uh, through the chair of the council member, that's correct. Okay, and I would, again, um, we know that a significant percentage of folks in the city don't have access to a vehicle or regular access, so ensuring that we get this right when it comes to really being accessible to the public and to our residents, I think is a really important thing. But Thank once you. again, I think inherently because of the transit line it sits on, the future multimodal on this street, um, the proximity to other neighborhoods, I think this is inherently much more accessible site in general. Um, and again, for reasons of cost and the additional space as well as um, the environmental benefits, I think the reutilization as well as I don't know that we need to be building any more office space right now in the city of Cleveland, so reutilizing, um, you know, uh, uh, well, maybe we do. I don't know. I'll look to Mr. Penny for that. But a reutilization of underutilized space, I think, is a really good move. Um, last question, Chair, to the Chief. Um, Chief, is it your professional opinion from a patrol officer from day one to yourself that this is the right facility for your functional needs? Chief? To the chair, yes, sir. Um, I believe this is a, a good facility. It gives us a, a pretty much a size. Obviously, it's not going to be a, a new build, but it gives right. us, a, a, in that sense, a clean slate mm -hmm. um, to design this building the way that we believe is the best for our operations in the Division of Police. Thank you. And uh, chair to the chief, the brains of your operation sitting behind you in the other white shirt, she agrees with you? Uh, to the chair, uh, yes. Uh, she probably should be okay. sitting here instead of me, but yes, okay. she does. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. So what we're hearing at the table is that the Cleveland Police Department is going to be engaged in the design and the layouts, et cetera, because I've heard so often from officers about the Justice Center, whoever designed this place should have been thrown out the window. I've heard that from a few officers, okay? But I, the windows don't open over there. But the, the fact of the matter is it, it, was not, it, it was not advantageous for the police officers working in a building. And I'm hoping, not not just talking to the chief and the command staff, but to talking to the people who are gonna be in there doing the duty. So I hope that's the, to the, the chair, key thing. To the chair, councilman, we are heavily involved in design of this uh, the facility. Um, our our uh, staff is involved in every meeting, um, and uh, they take into consideration our thoughts, our recommendations. Good. Um, in this whole entire process. So I'm very happy with our involvement okay. thus far and we'll continue right Thank until you. we get the keys handed it to us. Good. Councilman Slife. Thank you. Um, I want to, I guess, build off of uh, Councilman Harsh's questions about the funding and the bonds because I know that that was so enthralling uh, to the listening audience. Um, so I, I, I pulled up, Mr. Chair, the ordinance that, the ordinances that were uh, referenced for the bond issuance, and in both cases, the language of the ordinance is improving building structures and other facilities, including new facilities, the including new facilities for the city of division of police. So my reading of it is that their bond issuance for general facilities, including the division of police. So the intent of the ordinance may have been to allocate these bond, bond sources towards a, a specific project, uh, but that the legislation is not narrowly tailored that those bond funds could only be issued to the division of police headquarters. Is that a correct reading through the chair? Um, I'm looking at uh, 509 in section one. It says for the 
and or, no, excuse me, facilities of and or for the division of police. I'm assuming that could have been a little bit, they might might be able to use it for some other things. Yeah, I, I, and I'll read it before, if, if yeah. I could before, just, just for context. Yeah. But I'm reading $65 million for the purpose of providing funds to improve facilities for the discharge of governmental functions or for services otherwise benefiting the public safety, health, and where, welfare, including acquiring, constructing, reconstructing, rehabilitating, installing, renovating, enlarging, and otherwise improving building structures and other facilities, including new facilities of and for the city division right. of police. That's, well, we're well, all we'll, in agreement. Yeah, and, so, and obviously we've asked, we've asked, we're going to ask for clarification from the finance director because obviously before finance, he will be at the finance table. So I'm hoping that the administration is going to carry back those, the requests and, and questions that have been raised at this table. Councilman Slay. Yeah, I, I bring it up for two reasons. Yeah. One, uh, because we are all painfully aware of our capital needs in the city. So to the extent that we didn't issue up to the full amount of the bonds, I can see where, you know, certainly we don't want to spend more money on any individual project than we need to, uh, but the need is certainly there citywide. So the question to build off of Councilman Harsh's is, why would we not issue for the full bonds just for the, the, the benefit of, of facilities writ large. So, so I under, we'll, I'll, I'll ask it again at, at, at finance, but I want to I wanna, uh, introduce it here. I guess the other kind of secondary question to that, Mr. Chair, is with the proposed project being at $90 million and us essentially amassing through the sub funds identified in 1446 19, uh, plus the bonds, plus the sub funds identified in this new ordinance, you know, we, we now have. I believe $71 million of cost savings, uh, so which is good. It's a, again, we don't need to overspend, but my question is, have there been conversations about where that $71 million will be allocated if it's not needed at the police headquarters? Director? Um, so, Mr. Chairman, the councilman, the, the problem is, is that we didn't have the budget to cover the $161 million needed for Opportunity Corridor and the 44,000 of square feet that would need to go elsewhere. So while we are achieving a cost savings, um, there's no core, there, it, it's not a dollar for dollar correlation of money that could be spent elsewhere because we didn't have them all of that cash in hand to begin with. Okay. So we had, again, we had 115 million of bond money that was spent, five that was put towards uh, uh, the Public Safety Training Center, which leaves $110 million for the Police Headquarters Project, um, $90 million for TurnDev, $9.5 was spent on, you know, the Opportunity Corridor, land acquisition, other costs. So, you know, your savings is, is, is now down to, what, 10.5? 10.5. <coughs> Um, of, of actual dollars. Well, we'll and we're going to want th those actual numbers, what has been spent to date and for what purpose. So yeah. we can see the big picture as, because again, all of us have concerns about police districts, firehouses, et cetera, et cetera, in our communities that are in poor condition. So, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, the, and, and, and that is a good point. So. The, the funds that are spent on public safety facilities right. are the, the bonds that are allocated for public safety facilities can be spent on other public safety facilities. So if there is a cost savings at the police headquarters, it could, for instance, go into a fire station, a police station, or any other public safety facility. It couldn't necessarily go into a rec center or into a, a park or or into City Hall, but it yeah. could go into a okay. public safety facility. Thank you. And, and, and uh, to the chair, you, you sort of read my mind. Uh, you know, I, I did a ride along on Friday with the first district, and you know, if we want to talk about, I, I'd have to imagine uh, that to the degree that we're losing police officers, we're not losing them from headquarters, we're losing them more often from the districts. And to the degree that community members 
today are having to go to engage with the police. They're not going to the Justice Center to do it. They're going to one of the five police districts. And you know, the first district, uh, you know, if we want to talk about community police relations, these, these districts look like bunkers. You know, and, and they're not welcoming to the community. They're not enjoyable to work in for the officers. They have substantial degrees of deferred maintenance. Uh, so uh, you know, I think part of the equation of why we're struggling to retain officers has to be that in addition to making more money elsewhere, you can work in a modern facility with all the computers functioning. And, and I, I understand the need for a new police headquarters, uh, but there's just something, something that rubs me the wrong way that we're sinking all this money into essentially management and uh, letting the rank and file uh, continue to operate in, in these antiquated uh, facilities. And, and then when you extrapolate further on uh, the, the needs of someone coming to make a report and it's just a window, you know, I had to go do a lineup at the second district a couple years ago, and I'm just sitting amongst a crowd of people looking at lineups trying to remember the incident I was involved in. You know, I, I, I'm hopeful that we can put the needs of our neighborhood police districts as a substantial level of focus. It's a, it's, it's a dire need. And to understand any amount of cost savings from the headquarters project and how we can meaningfully put that towards our police districts. Because in my opinion, one, two, four, and five don't need to be, they, they, they don't need to be renovated at this point. They need to be demolished and rebuilt because they're, 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 they're antiquated facilities that aren't meeting our needs for police community relations where they're actually happening. And, and Councilman, we that issue was raised earlier. You're exactly on on the point. Um, you ought to take a look at the fifth district. You want to talk about a depressing place, as the chief knows, because he worked there for a long period of time. So our men and women in blue deserve better uh, facilities, and our citizens need better facilities who interact with the police. So, thank you. Any other further questions? Hey, I just I look forward to digging deeper in finance. Thank you for keeping time, as always. Okay, Councilman C uh, Casey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Chairman, to the uh, to director, <coughs> if this is anticipated to open in first quarter or second quarter of 2025, at what point do we give the county notice that we'll be out of the Justice Center and no longer paying rent except for that uh, what it, we're staying a thousand square feet in there um, through the chairman of the council and yes it would be about a thousand square feet related to the court operations so um, we will need to have another lease amendment with the county um, the terms of that lease amendment may be a little bit different because we know that we'll be ending our relationship with the county at that point but if the terms were the same it would be a, um, a three month notice um, to be able to vacate any or a part of the space that we lease at the county. And Mr. Chair, Mr. Chairman, the director, when does our current lease end with them? Uh, current lease, the current lease ends in October of uh, 2023. 2023, could we do it on a yearly basis, right? Yes. Okay, so we'll have to sign one more with them, right? To get us through October of 2024. Mm -hmm. Possibly two more. Well, we, one and a half maybe. Yeah. I mean, if we're looking at opening in the second quarter, so. Yeah. Um, is it possible for that next lease to be for a year and a half? Um, um, is that something you could negotiate with the county? Through the chairman of the councilman, that's exactly what we would like to do um, so that we just have to go back to county council, city council wants to, to handle the rest of the time that we would need. Okay, and Mr. Okay. Chairman to the director, at our peak <clears throat> moment in the Justice Center, how many square feet did we rent from them? Or did we, when we sold, when we sold our portion of the Justice Center to them, how many square feet did we sell, do you know? Uh, I have that here. If if you guys talk about other things, okay. I can okay. Find okay. While, while you while you here. look it up, I'll ask the chief. Chief, yeah. uh, you'd mentioned earlier that um, just on another topic, since the director's looking something up, uh, we only have one rider for for the the mounted unit, and we have a rather large event coming up on Friday. And does that mean we only have one horse that will be in the parade for Friday? To the chair, Councilman Casey, I'll double check on that. I'm, I don't want to give you an incorrect answer right now, but I'll double check. Okay. And then while the director's still looking it up, I'll ask Mr. Penny. Mr. Penny, um, to, to the chairman, to Mr. Penny, who is the electric supplier for the Art Craft Building? 
Lock your contractor? Yeah. Oh, supplier. Oh, supplier. Okay. Yeah. Good point. I'm currently it's it's um, First Energy, but uh, CPP does stub at on pain. Our, we're exploring bringing it north up 24th to support the building, if that's what you're inquiring about. Yeah. Mr. Chairman and Mr. Penny, do you know how long your contract is with the other electric supplier? It's month to month. Okay. Mr. Chairman to Mr. Penny, has there been a conversation with uh, Cleveland Public Power? I believe at the administration level there's been discussions, um, but that is something that's on our, our agenda to uh, commence formally, and the administration's request is to have CPP service the building. All right, Mr. Chairman, to the administration who you're representing, uh, is that conversation ha been had? Is it planned? When is it planned for? Uh, through, the, through the chair to the council member, uh, we have not had formal conversations yet, but uh, they're aware of the request to extend the service. Who's, who's, so we, uh, we'll be reaching out through uh, CPP engineers. I, I don't recall the name of the engineer that was reached out to at this time, but. Okay, so Mr. Chairman, to, to the, why hasn't it happened yet? If you know that this is going forward and you know that that question's at least gonna come specifically from me at this table, why haven't we had those conversations with Cleveland Public Power yet to, to possibly look to, to supplying this building? Uh, through, the count, uh, through the chair to the council member, uh, the, basically the answer is we're not under contract here yet. Obviously that's an outcome of this legislation. Uh, it's, you know, we haven't signed the contract yet, so we're still uh, in the preliminary stages of that. Um, but it is our every intention to uh, to get CPP power at all. All right, and Mr. Chairman, to to commission, hey, commission, uh, director, manager of architecture, manager, yeah, um, Carter. Is what, fine. When do or or to the director? When do you plan on signing the contract? If all this legislation gets passed, when do you plan on signing the contract? Uh, John, we also we can talk a little bit about where we are in the process, but it would be imminent after the passage of legislation. Oh well, imminent could be forever. John, where do you think you are on the on I, your side? I would estimate having um, the contractual terms finalized within the next two weeks. We had a very productive meeting this week on some additional items. Um, so our goal would be to, to sign as soon as possible. Okay. Um, the deal terms are 95% uh, complete. Um, there's one business term that's outstanding, uh, but then the, the community benefits agreement and the project labor agreement need to be finalized. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, Thank you, uh, Councilman Case. You bring up very valid points. I would just say this to the administration. I, I, um, I'm as serious as a heart attack on this one. We're going to own a building. It better be on CPP. You want me to repeat that again? We're going to own a building. It better be on CPP. You're not going to. You're not going to make the same mistake here that you made on Metro Hospital. We could have been servicing Metro Hospital, and that deal was blown by the city, by CPP, and we lost out on that. We're not going to lose out on this building. I want to make that very clear here to all involved at the table. And if, we, if we don't look out for our own best interests, no one else will. And it, it, it upsets me that people aren't looking out for our best interests there. So that building, that police headquarters will be on CPP. And um, Mr. Chairman, to the, to the administration, that side, and even Mr. Penny, if I can help in any way with that, please let, let me know if you run into a stalwart with Cleveland Public Power or anything with that, please let me know so I can, I can help. I'll just add, I think some of this um, is, is on our end. It's where the line ends from CPP is still something where our engineers are looking at, uh, but the administration's mandate's been clear, but we will need help from CPP because it is clear it doesn't pull all the way north to Superior. And we have projects in five wards. We struggle to figure out which service is at what corner, and sometimes we have redundant duplicate service, sometimes we don't. So in one of our projects in Ohio City, CPP's on one corner, on the other two blocks over, it's First Energy. Right. So. 
whatever we could do to support it, but we will need help with CPP to pull the line probably 300 yards or 200 yards north up 24th and 25th to, to connect to the service well, of the Mr. building. Well, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Penny, we, we can help. Yeah. We can help bridge that gap in whatever way we need to, um, okay. but we won't let it go by the wayside or slip through the cracks. I'm, I want to make sure I work with you to, make, yeah. to get this done. And we done. are opening yeah. up the soil all the way south of our site for the garage, so we will have that portion mm -hmm. excavated so we could um, accommodate the conduit to, yeah. to pull it on a yeah. burial basis, all right. but we would definitely need help. We're right. in, in the chairman of the Utilities Committee has, has made that, uh, that pledge to help. I hope the administration understands the significance of our request. We're not about to continue to lose customers and, and not be aggressive. We, we need to be aggressive um, and we need to quit supporting a company that tried to put us out of business, you know, who was just convict, who, who just was, uh, con uh, you know, um, were two public officials who just uh, uh, convicted of accepting bribes from them. So let's, let's be realistic about what we have to do here um, and what, how we have to look out for our own best interests. Are there any more questions of the members of the body? Mr. Chairman, yes. did, the, did the director, did you find that? Um, Mr. Uh, through the chairman of the councilman, I don't have the full square footage. Could you just of the, get it back to us I by will. finance? Thank yes. you. Thank you, Mr. Councilman chairman. Kelly. Uh, through the chair to, to the group, specifically when it comes to residency, uh, I understand that you, know, you, you can get uh, local contractors and sometimes it's harder to get people that live in the city in the, in the union building and trace construction. My thought is, do you have anything in, in place for some of our students, young men and women that would like to make a, a proud, good living in the building trades? You know, we have, uh, through CMSD, we have the Max Hayes, or just any of our people. Is there anything, anything set aside through the building trades that, hey, we would like some apprentices from CMSD or from our city to be put on this. In two years, you can get more than halfway in some of these unions to be a journey person. I, I can answer that. Um, Chief Epstein with, I think, uh, Councilman Hairston's um, comments incorporated that into the community benefit terms. We are circulating those, uh, both apprenticeship, internship, uh, participation with CMSD. Um, we're circulating those with our team, and, and um, I'll also note that those requirements also um, align with the Inflation Reduction Act incentives that we are targeting. So we do in intend to, um, to accept those uh, requests uh, by Chief Epstein. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Good questions. Okay. Oh, yes, Con Councilwoman House. Sorry, thank you. Um, through the chair to the director, um, do, do you have or uh, when do we anticipate having um, like a trades and service list for this project? Go ahead. Uh, through the uh, chair to the council member, um, as I mentioned, there will be multiple packages, so each package mm -hmm. will have its own trades uh, list. So the first, uh, the first GMP package, John, when. And we probably within 120 days would be our goal. Okay. Okay. So that would be that would be a pretty significant chunk of the trades at that point. So we. So you said it'll be in 120 days. That's six months from now, give or take, ish. Ish, maybe. Yeah, four months. Ish. Okay. So this is one of the things of like, how do we work to, through the chair to the director, what is our plan to prepare? to at least have a pool. So generally, we know general trades mm -hmm. and services. What is our plan to ensure that we can reduce the, um, reduce the barrier uh, of entry for people? We got six months, give or take. What is our plan to do okay. that? Maybe you can answer that in a, uh, quickly because some members have to leave yeah. to go to another uh, event. So uh, th through the chair to the council member, I'll just say quickly, we, um, th the uh, project labor agreement and the community benefits agreement are the mechanisms for that. And what we are able to do with this delivery method as opposed to traditionally is actually work proactively with OEO so that they have, they have lists of potential subcontractors. They are able to help to make those connections uh, ahead of time as we're vetting people who are capable of doing the work 
and making sure we're reaching out to as many uh, MBE, FBE, and, and CSB as possible. Good. Thank you. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to thank the folks that are here from the administration, Mr. Penny, my colleagues, the two chairmen, Councilman Harrison, um, and um, I want to thank a Councilman, um, I got a mind block here. Um, let me see. And Council, uh, Chair Harrison and Councilman Bishop, Chair Bishop, thank you very much for your attendance. Um, you've heard of concerns, you've heard of requests from council members. You're going to have, have that for us by the Finance Committee. Um, you've heard of concerns about CPP. We'll do whatever we have to do from our side of the table. You've told us what this is going to cost. And I want to make it very clear, as I said earlier, it's about, it's about transparency. The administration was not transparent to us when you presented the Opportunity Corridor. What we were told at the table was one thing, and then what we found out after the fact was something different. That we were, you were not going to be able to house all these other sections within CPD. We were never told that. We were told this was going to be the place, except for the mounted unit <coughs> and some other things like the Justice Center, et cetera. And then we find out differently. I don't want to find out differently after the fact that, that um, no, this is not going to accommodate our needs. Because at that point, at that point, it's going to be difficult around this table. You got to be upfront with us. You got to be honest with us. If there's something that's going to change between now and the construction period, or as it pertains to deployment and who's going to, then you need to be upfront with the council president and all members of the body. We don't want to find out about it after the fact, because at that point, you're going to have members going to be on you like white on rice. As I quote my late dear friend Fannie Lewis, you, and, and we want to be assured that the police are going to have input into this process. So the ultimate building, when, when, when the chief gets the key, um, that that building accommodates the needs of the clean police department, our men and women in blue, and also is accessible to our citizens that our citizens have access to that building. Not like the Justice Center, where that's a just, it's terrible to have to go down there as a citizen to go to that building. So again, I thank my colleagues for the line of questioning. I thank the previous committees that uh, the municipal services and properties that had heard this once before. And so at this point, without any objections, this legislation is approved, is read, please sign it up. Is there anything else for the good in welfare? Chief, as of today, can you tell us how many officers are within the ranks of the Cleveland Police Department? Yes, sir. Uh, to the chair, to the council members. Uh, today, currently, we have 1,282 officers. And sworn. 82 officers sworn. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. Without any further ado, I want to thank my colleagues. This committee is adjourned. Thank you. Please sign up the legislation.